I, I'm, I'm liking the vibe here with the, with the audible responses. Sometimes we get a good morning and like weary souls uh, come to the well. But I'm really glad you guys are here. I'm thankful to be here. Um, really grateful that you have decided to spend Sunday morning with us. So we are wrapping up a series, a three-week series today called The Lost Art of Gratitude. So gratitude... We kind of all have a, 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 an idea of what gratitude is, right? It's a kind of, uh, in, our, in our minds, it's sort of a feeling of being thankful, right? And so it's, it, I would say it's actually one of the most important virtues that a believer can possess. And yet so often it's, it's overlooked, cast aside. Um, we are not as grateful as we ought to be. Can we all agree on that? We don't all practice gratitude. Gratitude is an emotion. Let's don't get that um, confused. Gratitude is most certainly emotional. It is an emotion, but it is also a practice. It is something that takes work. Gratitude takes work, right? It, it, it's a virtue. It's something that it, it's not just bestowed upon us. It, it takes a lot of work, a lot of thought, um, Sometimes we relegate to being thankful to, to just an emotion and it never makes its way into the day-to-day discipline of our lives. So in the series, what we've been looking at is what scripture says, that's important, what the, not what I say, not what Shannon says, not what we think or feel, but what scripture says. Because scripture is our authority, amen? We don't, we don't need to twist... Uh, 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 mold and shape our, our uh, scripture around our viewpoint. Um, I, I, my mind and heart can't be trusted. I don't know about yours, right? We can't be trusted to just discern truth without a, a, a bedrock of truth that a foundation of truth. Scripture is our foundation. So to look at what scripture says about the virtue of gratitude and how to live that life of worship and thankfulness as we approach Thanksgiving, no matter what life brings. So in week one, we talked about gratitude uh, for what God has done in the past. Looking, peering into the past, our past and ancient past at the same time, right? We can look at scripture thousands of years ago and see the faithfulness of God and see what God has done and be thankful for that, amen? Amen. Because without all of that that we read about three, 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, we cannot even attempt to be grateful for the little things in our present circumstance. So peering into the past produces gratitude. And, and, and last week, uh, we talked about how to be grateful in our present state, our, our, our present sufferings, if you will. Because we can all agree that Suffering and chaos and hardship cast a shadow over this life. I'm not saying that life isn't good. Life is so good. But when we think about our present circumstances, usually the bad stuff, the negative stuff, the hard stuff wins out in our mind, correct? Isn't that true? It's not that we're not just negative people walking around, what was me, like, but when we think about just current, and I'm not talking about any, just, just you know, you're in a financial crisis alone or you got a health um, thing going on. We're talking about from the eyes and the perspective of a believer, right? A believer. And when, this, when, when, uh, when uh, Paul and, and others wrote to the first century churches, the early churches, they were writing about current circumstances from the perspective of persecution, They were writing from the perspective that Christians were not well liked and loved in this world. And that is that is more true today than it's ever been. Amen. Now, you and I are not going to come near the suffering and the heartache and the hardship that most believers experience around the world here in this country. But I got to say, I think there's a chance that it's coming. I got to say, it doesn't matter who your president is. It doesn't matter uh, what state of affairs, for, you know, uh, foreign, domestic, all that stuff. I, I got to say that it, from according to Scripture, you know, if you read anything, Daniel and Revelation, all that, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. 
So how can we be grateful in present suffering? We're gonna kind of touch on that again today. But this morning, as we wrap the series up, I wanna look forward. I wanna look at the present, where we are, and then looking forward. So we're gonna look at how we can cultivate gratitude for the future. Gratitude for the future. The key question for us to ponder this morning is this. What in the world do we have to look forward to? Because I, I know, I'm sure, that a, a crowd this size, there's at least one person in here that would say, honestly, they, they don't really have much to look forward to at the moment. At the moment. That you're stuck in this... Um, Somebody hit pause on your life and, you're, and or you're just, you just feel like there's not a whole lot that you can look forward to. What does the future hold for us, not just as people, but Christ followers? That's the question. What does the future hold for us? Well, there's certainly a lot we don't know about the future. This is not about being Nostradamus and predicting the future. We don't know a lot of things about the future. But... But there is something incredible that you and I, every one of us, can look forward to. And we, can, we can peer into the, in the future, and, and Scripture tells us ultimately what's coming. And it will produce gratitude like you've never known. What you believe about the future will impact the rest of your belief system. What you believe as a Christian about the future impacts every other part of your faith. What you believe about what's coming impacts everything else. Having an accurate biblical view of the future, not only your future personally, but in a larger scale, the future of creation itself and what the Bible says about that is key to your walk with the Lord. It's so key. So what we're talking about today is really a foundational thing here. In, 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 in week one, we had a central truth that I want to come back to, and it's this. Gratitude is the fuel for the Christian life. Gratitude is the fuel for the Christian life. And our anchor passage comes from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. And this is what it says. Rejoice always. Pray Continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He's talking to, to Christians, to believers. Rejoice always. Pray all the time. And be thankful no matter what life brings. But being thankful no matter what life brings is not just you pulling yourself up by the bootstraps and say it's going to be, and, and giving, you a, giving yourself a self-help talk. Justin, it's going to be all right. Or someone else doing that. Friends, we need less self-help, motivation Monday, and more scripture. We need more promise. We need more promise. We need something more concrete than trying to, to make ourselves feel better in the, in the, in the meantime. That's, that's, that's not the way of, of, a, of a person who, who is following Jesus. It's not. So two principles this morning we want, I want to touch on, and these are kind of big churchy words, but they're, they're, they're actually they're very, very important to our foundation as believers, what we believe about this. First is, is God's what we call sovereignty. Anybody know what that is? God's sovereignty. That means God is in control. He is in control of the past, the present, and the future. So there's, there's security in knowing that God is in control. Now, our, 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 we question God's sovereignty when bad things happen in our world. That, to me, that, that's, one of the, that's one of the biggest, biggest uh, hurdles for someone who's not a Christian to get over when it comes to belief. One of the biggest ones is, well, if God is in control, then why is the world the way it is? Why do we see the pain, the suffering uh, that we see in this life? Why isn't God doing something about it? Well, God has done something about it by sending Jesus to a cross. And God will do something further 
at the end of time, and we're gonna see that today in a, in a very, very pivotal scripture, God is in control. Whether you believe that or not, he is. And God is good, even when life is not. God's sovereignty. Secondly, we're gonna look at God's providence. This is the fact that God is providing for all that we need. God will provide. He is creator, sustainer, provider. So when talking about the future, it's one thing to say God has done this. So we, that's a concrete example in scripture and in our, in our lives. Hopefully you can peer into, back to, into your past and go, I saw God's hand in this. The older we get as believers, the more we see God's hand in things, I, I would hope. As we grow and mature, we see God working and moving and we, we, can, we can like hold on to that. And it does give hope. It does give hope in the present and for the future. But it's another thing entirely to say with confidence that God will do something. It's one thing to say God has done, but it's a whole other level of faith to say God will do this, correct? God will do something. How can we have assurance that God is gonna do something great in our future? How, can, how do we have assurance that God's gonna provide? How do, how do we have assurance that God is in control and, and gonna sustain and, and, and carry us to the end as we just sang? How, how do we have assurance that we're gonna be faithful to the end? How do we have that assurance? This is our train of thought this morning as we turn to our main text and it is Romans chapter eight, verses 18 through 28. And I, I wanna say this, I, Romans chapter eight is I believe one of the most important chapters in all the Bible. So much good stuff here. We had a, actually had a series a couple of years ago just in Romans chapter eight. And we could have gone, it was like an eight week series maybe, I can't remember. We could have gone like eight more weeks. There's so much good stuff in Romans eight. Many, many theologians and scholars believe that Romans chapter eight is like the, the pinnacle of scripture. It's, 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 some say the most important chapter in the whole Bible. And it's so crucial, uh, the chapter is so crucial because it shapes so much of our theology and our understanding of the gospel and who God is. And, and especially this section shapes what we, what we feel and how we should look at our present and our future. And particularly the section we're going to look at 18 through 28 is critical to understanding the discipline of gratitude as we look at our future. So we're gonna read this together. And we're gonna go just verse by verse here and, and, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about this together. I, I think this is something that we just need to sit in and settle in and, and let just kind of wash over us because it's just so good. Beginning in uh, Romans 8, beginning in 18, it says, I consider that, I consider that our present sufferings, this is Paul writing, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. Verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the spirit, he's talking to believers here, groan inwardly as we await as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. That word hope is super important here where we're going. But the hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Anybody ever been there? 
We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now, they're wordless to us. Isn't that a, isn't that a cool thought? When you're, 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 you want to pray, and the, the words aren't just, they're just not coming. You want to pray, but there's not a thought in that head. You want to pray, but you're overwhelmed by what you're experiencing currently. You want to pray, but you feel inadequate to even begin the prayer, right? It's not that you're scared that the words aren't going to come out right. You just don't have any words at all. Have you ever been there? Well, don't, don't ever shy away from prayer just because you don't have words that are coming to mind because the Spirit is praying for you. And what you need to be praying, what you, what you want to pray What you should pray is being prayed for you on behalf of you from the Spirit to God. He's the go-between, the advocate. He's the stand-in. He's the messenger from God to us and from us to God. So don't ever, don't neglect to pray. When it says pray continually, don't neglect to pray just because the words aren't coming. Some of the most powerful prayer times I've ever, ever experienced in my life and I've told our students this, is I had my Bible open and I just literally took whatever chapter it, 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 it flung open to and I'm sitting there and I'm just in my thoughts. I don't have an agenda. I'm just trying to spend time with God and I have no idea where I'm going or where this is going. And if I spend enough time in that posture, mind and heart, then... I, I begin to feel God's presence. He begins to move and speak to me and I haven't spoken a word to him yet. And the spirit is speaking my heart to the Lord on my behalf, right? Sometimes we neglect to pray just because the words aren't there and if we don't feel inclined that to say something profound to God, then we just don't pray at all. Friends, that is a mistake. That is a mistake. It's a critical, critical painful, sad mistake that we all have made. Verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with wordless groans. I love that. And he searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. And finally, the the verse that some of us, many of us have memorized. And if you haven't memorized it, 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 there's, I can't think of a better memory verse than this, Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work for the good of those who what? Love him, who have been called according to his purpose. So what is Paul getting at? What's Paul getting at? Well, he's, he's, writing to first century Christians who are enduring incredible suffering and hardship and persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. So you might say, well, that has nothing to do with me. It most certainly does. If you are breathing, you are enduring some sort of suffering. Correct? You might, things might be going well with you right now and for you. Amen, praise God for that. But if there is breath in your lungs, you have experienced, are currently experiencing, or will experience great suffering. So so he's talking about a present state of suffering. Not just for, now yes, every person on this earth, whether they know Jesus or not, is going to suffer. Going to suffer. So this is where it kind of messes with our theology a little bit because we have in our minds when we step into relationship with Jesus, the the mindset is really, and naively so, that things are going to get better for us in our daily lives as we walk with Jesus. I would argue they get worse. Now, ultimately, they are, it's better. I've never met anyone who knows Jesus that said, I regret that decision. Never, and you'll never meet one. Someone who knows Jesus Christ as their savior will never go back on that decision. 
I, I, I don't believe that to be true. I, I think people walk away from their faith and, and um, you gotta wonder whether they, were, they ever knew Jesus or not. Now that's just kind of the, where I sit right now. But everyone, believer or not, is going to suffer in this life. But he's talking specifically to believers. We are enduring present suffering. But he says, I consider what I'm going through and what you're going through now is nothing compared to what's coming. And, and friends, if you don't know what's coming, we need to know, we need to search the scriptures and know we need to have a foundation for our future. If we are not excited, if we, you and I are not excited about the future, our future in Christ, then it's because we don't know enough about what's coming. It's because we are ignorant of what's coming. Sometimes it's because we haven't, we, quite honestly, we just don't know our Bibles well enough. Other times we allow the weight of the pressure and the, the suffering, the things that are going on just to, 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 to weigh us down so much that we just kind of get into a distorted mindset. We just go, well, I guess God doesn't care about me in my life. Present suffering. And then he, he goes on, he, he talks about, look, not just you, you're not just suffering. You know what he says? He says, all of creation is suffering. Do you know that because of sin, sin has wrecked everything. Sin has wrecked our universe. Now, God is certainly in control, but the sin snowball effect is, 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 is gaining traction. But it's, it's actually gaining traction towards something. It's not, not, it's not just going at breakneck speed just, and just because it's just gonna hit the wall. God has a plan in suffering, by the way. A plan. He has a plan in suffering, in your personal suffering and the suffering of the entire universe. He says, all of creation groans with anticipation, waiting for God to do what ultimately he wants to do waiting for God to fulfill a promise from the beginning of time, and that is to redeem all of creation, to set it right, to do away with sin once and for all, and everything that comes with it, the suffering, the pain, the hardship, death itself, death itself. And it began, it began on the cross, but it will end in what we call a future glory. That's the, actually the heading of this passage if, in your Bibles. If you look, uh, some will have different headers, but mine says present suffering and future glory. Future glory. So there's a, there's a suffering that we endure now that we will endure until we breathe our last breath here on earth. But there's an anticipation the word we would use is a hope. A hope in this passage, a hope. There is a hope. It's not seen with our eyes and we, we don't, we haven't, we haven't uh, God won't let us really peer into the future, but God has given us his word that there is a hope. And this is where the faith comes in. It's just, it's just how much we trust Scripture. It's just how much we trust that God will do what he says in scripture that he's going to do. So all of creation waits and groans. He says it groans. So we're in a current state of groaning and, and, and decay. The world around us, as beautiful as it is, is in a state of decay. I like to say that, you know, um, compared to what, the original state of creation was and to comp compare it to what it will be when Jesus returns. And this world is, it's ugly compared to what it will be, right? Not just physical beauty, but glorification, glory. That word glory is, is a thing that we don't really understand. Glory, what does glory mean? He says, we're looking forward to a future glory, a future glory. For us, glory is recognition and fame. But you know where that glory goes? It doesn't go to us. Where is that glory pointed? It's pointed to Jesus Christ. Christ will be glorified 
in the new creation, at the end of time, when Jesus returns, by the way, he's coming, he's returning. Could be now, wouldn't it be awesome if he just like bust up in here like right now and then, it'd be great. My wife says all the time, I just want Jesus to come back. Anybody there? Raise your hand if you're like, some days you get home from work or school and you're like, I just want Jesus to come back. Nobody? Oh my gosh. Some days I get home and I just go, I just want Jesus to come back. All right, my wife says it all, that's her line. That's what she says. And, and she wouldn't say that if she didn't know what was coming. She wouldn't say that if she wasn't sure of, of the blessed hope that we all have in Christ, glory. You see, all of us exist for God's glory. In good things, in bad circumstances, sickness, health, all of it, uh, mountaintop, valley, everything in life exists to worship God, to bring glory to God. What is the source of gratitude? There's gotta be a source. We can't just say, you should be nicer to people. You should just treat people better. You should just have more gratitude. That's, that's not the way it works because in the heart, the heart has to change before the, the head and, and the, the words and the actions change, correct? The heart must be transformed. I need to be remolded and reshaped to be a person of gratitude, to be a person that practice it, practices it. I don't need to just be nicer. It's not about being nicer. It's about reflecting the glory of God to our world. And the, the, gratitude is a byproduct of us knowing it and be sure of what is to come. Even as we endure the worst hardship imaginable in this life. That is what this passage is about. Where, where does gratitude come from? It originates at the cross. And then as we anticipate what's to come, the hope of glory grows within us as we eagerly await. Paul says, as we wait patiently, I'm not really patient. I'm, I'm the least patient person, I bet you, in this room. I struggle with patience. I know it's a you know, fruit of the Spirit. Some days I'm super patient, but most days I want what I want, when I want it, how I want it. I'm not patient. He says, you gotta be patient. You gotta be patient. In the meantime, we sing, we pray, and what flows forth from our lives is an unbelievable river and a wellspring of joy and thanksgiving if we have the hope in the right place. If our hope is founded on a, on a, on a hope for the future, as we see in Scripture, the hope of glory, then we can be truly grateful. If you're a note taker, for uh, my first point would be that gratitude is rooted in the hope that comes from knowing Christ. Gratitude is rooted in the hope that comes from knowing Christ. The hope, the hope, the hope that, yes, my life is not great right now, maybe. Yes, I'm enduring things and I'm saying, why God and all this stuff, but I know my hope is, is, is peering into the future and understanding and knowing that one day, tomorrow, 10 years from now, or in eternity, God is gonna set things right, right? I would say this, even from, if the, from the beginning of your life to the very end, if this life, this side of eternity is awful in every way, even if that were true, you still have a hope for the future. And it is founded in eternity with Christ, in Christ. Knowing Christ is where hope comes from. Not just knowing about him, but having a, a relationship with Christ. That is where gratitude comes from. It's rooted in that. In this passage in Romans 8, Paul is encouraging believers to look at their present situations in light of what's coming. And you might say, well, that's great. It's very philosophical and beautiful, but it doesn't help me in the now. But if you go back to 1 Thessalonians 5 and you rejoice always and you pray continually and you give thanks in all circumstances, even when you don't feel like doing it, gratitude will begin to well up in you. 
gratitude will begin to well up in you. So there's a hope. He's, he's talking about a future hope, hope for the present, hope for the future. And hope is what gives birth to gratitude. Hope is that the core of what we believe as Christians. We gather because we have a hope. We don't gather so we can feel better about the, the week that's coming because I got all these meetings. I got this thing going up, coming up and I need to kind of get a boost. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to church so I can kind of get a boost, a moral boost, right? So that I can face, yes, we, we, this is a church, the, the, the community of believers is an oasis. It is a, it is a place where we are encouraged and put, pressed forward. It is that. But it's not, that's not the reason we gather. We gather to worship and bring glory to God. Why? There's, it's not just a glory because, just because of God did something in the past. Yes, God did the ultimate thing 2,000 years ago, but it's ultimately, it's looking forward to what God will do, amen? What, what he will do in eternity, what he will do. And we don't know when that's coming. That's why we're so, we wait eagerly for it to happen. That's why we say on the hardest days, I just want Jesus to come. Or at the very least, God, why don't you do something? That is an eager anticipation, amen? It's not always joyful, but there's an eager anticipation to wait on God to do something that we can't do for ourselves. So this is, this is where gratitude comes from because the more we know God and the more we know what God's up to when it comes to the future, gratitude flows forth from my life. I'm, I'm less stressed I'm less worried, I'm less self-focused, and I'm more Jesus-focused, I'm more sure than ever that even though this day is terrible in the worst circumstances, have you, ever, have you ever walked with someone or met with someone and you, you just don't know how in the world they're even getting through the circumstance they find themselves in? Have you ever had a friend or family member that you sat with or, or mourned with or, or just spent time with, and you go, man, they're, they're more joyful than I am. They're more hopeful than I am. Why? Because God is near to the brokenhearted. And friends, this is where true gratitude comes from. It is not circumstantial. And it's not, um, it, it's not it doesn't, uh, it doesn't uh, ebb and flow with how our lives are going. It is a constant. The, the hope is constant. And the hope that we have in Christ is an anchor for our souls. Second point, God is working out your future now, right now. God is already in your future. God is the God that goes before. He's standing in your future because I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but look, God, where God is, well, God's here, but God is, sits outside of our space and time. So literally, all of history, what we call history, is laid out before God. He is present at every point on that timeline. Isn't that amazing to think about? It's, my, it's really mind-blowing. It's like the Matrix kind of deal, Inception. I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Like it's very, very, it's confusing how God could be 3,000 years in the past and 3,000 years of the future and, and in 2024 at the same time. But he is. He's outside of space and time. So God doesn't see things the way you and I do as in past, present, and future, and time just rolls on. In eternity, there will be no time. We'll just be there. We'll just be there. And so he's the God that goes before. He's standing at the day of your birth, at the day of your funeral, and then your grandchildren's funeral, and the great, 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 and he's standing in eternity as well with our loved ones that have gone before. So he's the God that goes before. He's standing in my future. Philippians 1, verses three through six says this. I thank God, hear that gratitude. I thank God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, I always pray for joy, pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the de first day until now. Being confident, here's the, here's the hope, being confident in this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So Paul is saying here, look, you don't have to be shaky about the future. Paul says you can be sure that what God has started in you, salvation, redemption, what God has started, he will complete. Praise God for that, amen? He, your salvation is not in your hands. 
I don't like the, 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 the theological viewpoint that somehow I've not earned salvation, but somehow I can do enough for God to stop loving me. I don't like that. We can have assurance, friends. Your salvation is not in your hands. It belongs to Jesus Christ. It belongs to God. And if it were in my hands, that Jesus would have had to die once for every sin they ever committed. Friends, there is a hope and assurance in this. It's the final word. It's the final word. He's saying, look, you can be sure that what he started, he will complete. In you and in what? Creation. God will finish what he started. That is assurance. It's the nature of hope. Number three, the future hope of eternity should overflow in your lives. It should overflow. The future hope in Christ should be an overflow in your lives. It, people should see it and recognize it and want it for themselves. The hope of glory, Christ in you, as Paul says, the hope of glory, Christ in you, the hope of glory, that is what the world needs most. We don't need self-help talks. We don't need Motivation Monday. We don't need a pat on the back. What we need is the hope of glory. What we need most is a sure thing. And there is no more sure thing than what God is going to do at the end of time and all things. You might say, well, that's a long way away. You don't know that. No man knows the day or the hour when Christ returns. It could happen today. You're not promised tomorrow. And even if Jesus doesn't come back today, you could be gone today. You could be gone today. Your heart could stop beating. The future hope that we, that we put our faith in is a sure thing. We can be grateful ultimately for the future hope we have in Christ. The hope of eternity with Christ. Nothing better than that. The future glory Paul is talking about here in this chapter is what all creation longs for. It's what all creation longs for. God is so good that he gives us a glimpse into the future. Just a tiny glimpse. Because he knows we need that. He knows we need that. Just a little glimpse into what is to come. You can read that in, in books like Revelation and Daniel and other things. And what a hope that we have. There's pictures in scripture of what eternity and heaven's gonna be like, right? And God gave John a vision of, of the future hope and when all things are set right and God has revealed, he's been revealed in you, by the way, that's what Paul says, God's glory is gonna be revealed in me, in me and in you. So there are two realities for Christians, two realities, present suffering and future glory present suffering, which is kind of the here and now, where we sit, and future glory. If you anticipate the future glory like we ought to, then friends, friends, you can endure anything this world has to throw at you. Not because you can endure it. Listen, because of Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can, Christ will, will, will carry you through present suffering as we speed toward future glory. So what do we have to look forward to? What, what do you have to look forward to? Is it retirement? Is it a 401k? Is it a stable job? Young people, is it to, to you know, marry the person of your dreams and have a, two or three kids and be well-adjusted and take a lot of trips and vacations and make a lot of memories? Is that what you have to look forward to? Those things aren't bad in themselves, but if that's all you have to look forward to, then we are missing the hope of glory. We're missing it. We're missing it. Our older people in the room, amen, we, we understand this. We're inching closer and closer to that future glory, maybe closer than, than others. But it is a hope that is sustainable for your present. It's a hope that you can bank on. You can bank on this hope. It's going to happen, whether you believe it or not. There's no greater thing to look forward to than the hope of eternity, the return of Christ, and the glorious future that awaits all of us. Amen? There's nothing we can, uh, that we can hope for more than that. And I know in the meantime, God is provider, sustainer, 
Savior. We have a hope in the present and we have the promise of eternal hope for our future. Hope gives birth to gratitude. Now, the practical side of this, friends, we need to persevere. Paul says, persevere to the end. Press on to the end. See things in your present state as God sees them through the lens of the future. Not the past, not the present, but the future. Practically speaking, going back to 1 Thessalonians 5, rejoice. You guys, that means worship. Worship with your lives. Worship with your vocal cords. Worship with your bank account. Worship with, with your, the way you raise your children. Worship with your, through your through jobs and, and careers. Worship through schoolwork and, and you know, high school and college. Like, oh Lord. Rejoice. Worship God. Worship God. Pray as much as you can. We call, we would call, I would call them breath prayers. Just walking around all day, just praying one line sentences to God. Two word sentences to God. Just being with God all day. And then going about your business. And then finally, giving thanks. And all, this is the hardest part, giving thanks in all circumstances. This is where you're just gonna have to do it. You're just gonna have to thank God no matter what. You're just gonna have to tell God how good he is even when life is terrible. And what will happen is because of your, your, your praise to God, because of that worship, that true worship, you'll begin to, your mindset will change and you'll start to really be grateful, even in the hardest circumstances. You'll praise your way through it, amen? You'll praise your way through that thing. And there'll be ups and downs in life. You might be here right now, tomorrow you might be down there, but in the end, the hope of glory, Christ in us, is what matters the most. And God has promised that to every single one of us. Friends, we need to persevere in gratitude, in the present state of things, so that in the end, why? why? Is that gratitude for us? No, it is for everyone else around us. Here it is. The gospel is when someone who doesn't know Jesus looks at your life and sees you enduring the worst hardships imaginable and you still thank God and praise God, that will bring about revival in Lowndes County. That's where it's gonna start. That's where it's gonna start. In a heart and a mindset and a, and a personality and a walk that people look to and go, there's gotta be something else out there. Yes, there is. There's a God who loves you, created you, and Jesus, a Savior who died for you. And we have a, a future hope. We have a future hope that we can put our hope in. We, we can, we can, that will sustain us. We can bank on it. It's an anchor for our souls. That's the precious hope, the hope of glory that we can share with everyone we know. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you have done. We know that you have done things that we, we're not even fully aware of. You've been good in ways that we can't even comprehend. God, I pray, as we, as we talked about in the, in two weeks ago in the, fir the first of this series, God, that we'd be able to look into our past and see clearly some of the things that you have done on our behalf. And that we would look at our present situations through the lens of your goodness. Give us joy where there is none. And finally, God, I pray that you would help us to anchor our lives, our hearts and our minds to the blessed hope of the future. The future is glorious. Why? Because you're in it and you're working in it and you're already there. You've told us to hang on, wait patiently, endure suffering. And in the meantime, worship God with gratitude. Father, we are on your timeline, not ours. Help us to be obedient in gratitude. Make our hearts overflowing with gratitude so that our friends and family in Lowndes County will see you, put their trust in you. 
that we will see revival in our time so that in eternity we can celebrate all that you have done and all that you are to do. In the meantime, encourage us, Lord Jesus. Encourage, we need your, we need your, your encouragement. We need your love and your grace. We need your, the, the grace that's gonna sustain us. Sometimes we just can't get to a place of gratitude. God, we're hard-hearted and oftentimes we're bitter. Break up the ground of bitterness in, in our hearts this morning. If there's any bitterness in me, God, cleanse me of that, heal me of that. Help me to put my eyes squarely on you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's worship.